Good afternoon and welcome to this special virtual viewing tour and Q&A of Hearts Holocaust Educational Arts. My name is Desiree Nazarian, Director of Outreach and Holocaust Education at Self-Help Community Services. So as a result of coronavirus, we had to cancel our staff reception for the Hearts exhibition, but I'm very excited to bring you this opportunity to still view the exhibit and meet one of the artists, Fred Turna, virtually. Hi, Fred. Hi, Nazire. Uh, it's so nice to have you here today, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Gladly done. Fred, before we begin the virtual viewing tour and a Q&A, I'd like to share some more information about the project, HEARTS. HEART stands for Holocaust Educational Arts, and it is an art exhibition featuring the personally created artwork and written works of Holocaust survivors that honors their experiences. The exhibition teaches those who view it about the diversity of survivors' wartime experiences, as well as serves as a conduit into the personality, wisdom, talents, and character that extend far beyond the definition of a Holocaust survivor. So all of the artwork that we are about to see is based on the Holocaust survivor artists' reflections and feelings from their experiences before, during, and after the war. In 1936, Self Help's founders made a sacred promise to serve as the last surviving relative for every Holocaust survivor. At Self Help, we've been committed to capturing and sharing the stories of the survivors we serve. And sharing survivor stories is truly an extension of our mission to serve as the last surviving relative. My hope is, is that this virtual gallery brings some connection and comfort to our self-help community during these strange and uncertain times. So speaking of uncertain times, before we begin, Fred, I was wondering if you would be willing to offer some of your thoughts on the challenges posed by having to stay home and if there's anything you believe viewers can do to ease the stress or if there's anything you've been doing that has been helpful. I'm trying to do as much as I can, being at home at ease and dealing with the history as it is evolving right now. I feel comfortable telling people that one can live with dangerous times and live with it, that is living in it without being disturbed beyond measure. There's more, you know, I could talk a lot more about these things. Uh, uh, being alone in the house most of the time, my wife Rebecca is in the hospital working. That is in a dangerous situation. So it is something that's very, very much on my mind. We lost as somebody whom we knew quite well, uh, Willy Wilhelm Helmreich, who died of uh, coronavirus a few days ago. So somewhere, it isn't an abstraction, it is something that hits home. And uh, so I'm living with that feeling of being in a dangerous situation, on the other hand, knowing that it's just nothing I can do to influence it. Yes, and um, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and my condolences to you and everybody who knew um, Mr. Helmrich. And you mentioned that your wife is in the hospital currently working. Is she a first responder? Yes, she is. A, she's working in the hospital. I mean, she's over in her, in her 70s and uh, is there every day when she's working in a rather, I don't have to tell you about hospitals. She is dealing primarily with high risk obstetrics. So it is something that is not immediately impacting on her. However, she's in the hospital with all the other problems that hospitals have here in Brooklyn. 
Absolutely. Well, we all thank her for her services and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me and all the viewers who are tuning in amidst this situation, Fred. So Fred, um, I would like to share some more information about your accomplishments and a little bit of a bio before we view the virtual gallery. Um, so I'll begin with a little bit of your bio. So Fred Turner was born in 1923 and is a 96-year-old Holocaust survivor and painter living and working in Brooklyn, New York. Turner was born in Vienna, Austria, and lived in Prague from 1926 to 1940. From 1941 to 1945, he was in several concentration camps, among them Theresienstadt, Auschwitz, and Dachau. Fred was liberated on April 27, 1945, and after a period of hospitalization, returned alone to Prague. Turner then moved to Paris in 1946 and informally studied at the Académie de la Grande Chaumière and the Académie Julien, where he was inspired by the work of the Cubist and post-impressionist. Fred has lectured extensively and exhibited his work in several solo and group shows. His work is included in a variety of private and public collections, including the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, the Albertina Collection, Vienna, Austria, the Ghetto Fighters Museum, and Yad Vashem in Israel. Mr. Turner continues to work as an artist, painting in his studio, and is involved in keeping the memory of the Holocaust alive. His canvases seek to address the psychological space of trauma and in often incorporating the charged symbols of chimney and ash. Is there anything that you would like to add to that bio, Fred? Oh dear, how does one add on to 60 years of working? <laughs> uh, yes, these are my subjects, but not the only subjects. I'm quite involved in uh, the Museum of Jewish History in downtown New York. Uh, this is part of my activity, that is, my motto is be involved, and that is what I'm trying to do, both pictorially and to the extent that my body allows it, physically, lecturing, talking, and I used to talk a lot before I got a little old and went to schools, talking, answering questions, and talking essentially about the things that you are mentioning. It, it, relieves me of the obligation to be involved specifically. That's my way of doing it. At Self-Help, you've been quite involved in different programs um, that are quite meaningful that you've expressed to us, such as Witness Theater in the past, um, as well as now in Hearts, and your participation in Hearts and sharing your artwork as it relates to your Holocaust experiences has helped the people who are able to view the exhibit online learn about your history, your reflections from the Holocaust, and to pass down the stories that we learn um, and to continue to learn. And this is our obligation now. So thank you for your contributions to self-help as well as to the world and the community. It's gladly done. And I'm very happy to have that opportunity. What I'm going to do now is share the virtual gallery by sharing my screen. Here we have the virtual gallery of hearts. And as we enter the gallery, you can see that the inside looks as though you are in a museum style exhibition. And we created this because we wanted people to be able to view the exhibition and learn about the diversity of wartime experiences from Holocaust survivors that are self-help clients and to be able to gain an experience even though they may not be able to view the exhibition physically. 
Um, as I mentioned, the physical iteration of the exhibit has been postponed and closed due to COVID-19, and we are hopeful that in the future it will open up. In the meantime, this virtual exhibition will help draw us closer to your paintings and the other 16 survivors, artifacts, and paintings inside. So I'm going to zoom in further and take us to your specific painting, Fred. Wow, here it is. A striking, striking painting that is titled Late Cloud. So Fred, would you be able to please provide us with some information about this painting and the meaning behind it? This painting is one of a series of paintings about fire. Fire and Auschwitz chimney is one of the subjects that I am coming to again and again. Painting has become one of my ways of dealing with the past. I have nightmares like every other survivor, far too many of them, and painting is one way of handling my feelings. This particular painting shows actually just the flames. There are many others of that kind. And uh, I'm using that to relieve or perhaps alleviate things that are on my mind, in my soul. And uh, that allows me to cope with day-to-day -day problems. At times, over the years, it has been difficult, but I found that painting, and by the way, music too, has become one of the ways in which to, in which to deal with things that bother me. It is a form of self-help, a form of making things easier for me. It doesn't always work, but it works quite often and keeps me busy, also keeps me involved. And that is one of my ways of dealing with life, being involved. Now, this specific painting, mostly reds and dark, other dark colors, it sort of it speaks for itself. It depends on the viewer to interpret it. What you are missing in this particular projection of the painting is the surface. I use surface very, very much as a mode of expression. That is, I encourage people to touch my paintings. I'm quite aware of the technical aspects of painting, take some pride in it, feeling that what I paint has a certain amount of permanence. I know how quickly paintings tend to deteriorate, particularly oil paintings. I'm very, very much involved in making as long-lasting a painting as possible. Wow, that is very, very thought-provoking. And in this painting in particular, I've seen many of your paintings I've had the privilege to, um, and I've seen that there are different variations regarding the physical aesthetic and the touch and the feel. Many of your paintings, as you just mentioned, have raised surfaces where you can feel um, the canvas. This one in particular, if I were to run my hand across it, would I be able to feel the same type of physical touch in, in tactile touch, or is this a little bit different than the other paintings? It has less of a tactile surface than others. I have paintings where I use sand, marble dust, and collage type things to create a surface, not in order to use it as a visual material. If you see the surface as a visual thing, as a tactile thing, I failed. I used that to, in, to say that there is some depth, some physicalness to the painting. 
I believe very, very much in the physical, uh, in touching a painting. And, and baby lives by touch for a long, long time. Be, being able to touch, being intimate. That is, if I may touch somebody, that means the person has allowed me to get close. And being in touch involves both the physical and the spiritual aspects of it. Absolutely, that's brilliant. I am definitely picking up what you are saying. And it is a wonderful legacy piece in a way to have the viewer of your painting feel the surface to be connected to you as the artist, even if they don't know you. And something in particular with this painting, this is Late Cloud, and you have also loaned Fugitive Twist, which is the title of another painting, um, which is at the UJA Gallery right now, currently frozen um, due to the coronavirus. However, um, both paintings are extremely intense and striking. And something that I've noticed about your paintings personally is that no matter if you're viewing from a distance, from afar, or up close, the intensity and the impact, for me at least personally, is there. And there seems to be, without even, if I were to know you or speak to you, um, just looking at this, I feel impacted initially. Um, and it definitely stops me and forces me to look again and to look deeper. And the color schematics that you used as well tie into the theme of the series that you were speaking of earlier. Just a beautiful job. Um, so with that said, many of our self-help employees have been extremely curious and eager to ask you some questions. Are you up for some Q&A, Fred? Yes, I am. Wonderful. Okay, so I've received a lot of questions. Um, the first question comes from Adina Horowitz in our Manhattan Holocaust Survivor Program. Adina asks, how did your Holocaust experience influence your path toward becoming an artist? I probably became a full-time uh, or a, a way of be being an artist sometime in 43 in Theresienstadt. By then I was ne nearly 20 years old. And uh, while in Theresien, I started to make drawings, line drawings, on whatever material was available by whatever means there was. Uh, just standing or moving around and drawing things that were around me. People standing around, getting in line for, for a handout of soup from behind. You've seen pictures of it. We have a big drum and people, uh, somebody handling, sort of taking a ladle full into somebody's container. I painted triple deck, triple deck, deck bunks, the crowdedness, the well ordered chaos, and uh, trying to make some sense of my surrounding. I paint, I've wondered, most of my work was lost. When it was shipped to Auschwitz, I gave a box of things that I had been carefully hiding to somebody, <clears throat> the safe. Well, that person too was shipped to Auschwitz. And that happened once more. And when, after liberation, not right about whenever I could move, I started looking for these things and couldn't find them. It wasn't until the 1980s that I went with Rebecca, my, my wife, to Israel and found out that the kibbutz Givat Chaim Ikud, that had been founded by some people from Terezin, had drawings and asked me, what do you have? They said, we don't know, it's unidentified. And there were four of my items, actually five of my items in there. Yeah. And I kept, I left them there, I feel, 
that that is the right place. I have a, uh, pictures, I've some pictures of them, I made some pictures of them, photos. Beginner's art, clearly not an accomplished artist, far from it. But it seems that even then I was trying to express myself visually. What art done then, I feel, has historical value. It was made there and then, as against art that was made after the war, as for instance this painting that you've shown a little bit before. That's a different category. That is a commentary on what happened rather than a description. That is, particularly in my paintings, I do not describe, I am not an illustrator. The reason is very simple, that I feel it cannot be really done. Mm. Cannot put into graphics the, the feelings, the moment, the situation. The only artist who could do that long, long ago was Goya. And his disasters of war, small scale, book scale, uh, graphics, etchings of sorts, that is, aqua tends to be precise. And uh, he said everything and said it superbly. I'm not going to try something that has been done by a great, great master before. So, what I paint is Felix attitudes, deliberations, thoughts about what happened then. It is at the same time also a form of self-indulgence. Uh, you, somebody used the word catharsis. Yes, it is that too. And uh, it helps me to get over very, very difficult emotional times. And there have been more since the war, and I'm very fortunate to be able to do it. I'm able also learned to live with it, so I'm not thrown by the feelings. Nightmares, far too many. But I wake up and I realize, yeah, I'm out of it. So this is a wonderful feeling that I have that outlet. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. You are, you know, very lucky to be able to have that conduit to express yourself in. And I see behind you that you, this is your gallery space, correct? You're in your gallery right now? Yes. No, the gallery, the studio. You're rather right. Right. Wow. Thank you. So um, the next question comes from Yolanda de Souza, also from Self Help. She is specifically in Self Help's Department of Population Health. She would like to know, similarly to the answer you just gave, did you find that expressing feelings through artwork is therapeutic? Well, absolutely. So I, I cannot. I cannot. Uh describe it as such. That's a technical term, therapeutic. I'm a painter, and so that's what I do. She also would like to know, what stories would you like your art to tell? Actually, there are too many stories. They are implied without being spelled out. Again, I'm not an illustrator, and a painting reflects a situation of feeling about the Shoah rather than describing it in preci precisely. So one of the things that comes to mind is at one time I was nearly compulsory painting execution walls, not nice paintings, in bloody, you may imagine an execution wall wouldn't be a nice wall, but then after a while, I looked at the painting and the, name, the word wall brought up the, the Kotel, the wall in Jerusalem. And so I said, that's a good idea, and in paint wall in Jerusalem. So uh, that, at that time, I was 
just vaguely aware of. I'd seen pictures of it. I had not been to Jerusalem then. And I painted it. Then they decided it's a nice painting, but what was behind that wall? And so I built up an imaginary temple behind it. By then I had been studying quite a bit about Jewish history and Israel history. And uh, I was aware that there was a Herodian temple, which was not, of course, a real temple, the original one. But so I used my imagination and built up on that. And as one of the themes that I come back again and again to build that temple, eventually I put gates into that wall. So I went from the execution wall and the temple to the, the image of a, an open temple where one can enter that is way back there was that execution wall. So I've traversed um, quite a distance emotionally and intellectually. It brought me to a lot of studying, reading really, about uh, uh, Jerusalem, about Jewish history and Jewish background. That is quite profound and going from a place of despair to openness with your self-awareness um, sounds about right, like the process that you went through and encountered. My question, my follow-up question about that is, have you created any type of artwork outside of paintings um, as an extension of this learning process about Judaism and Judaica or Israel? I've used my rather faint knowledge about Jewish tradition to paint and some of the symbols come back again and again. One of them is a gate. I've done a lot of mezuzah covers. Mezuzah, the, the cloth is well described. You take the, it's a sort of a, a precisely prescribed how to write it. Uh, but the cover can be anything. So I've used the covers as a free expression to expand on that idea of having that verse of the cloth uh, surrounded or embedded in some of my work. And I've taken a lot of freedom there, but uh, Allah allows me that. I'd like to share something with you that's a bit personal, but I think important for many reasons. A few weeks ago, in my apartment building that I reside in, I keep mezuzahs outside of my door, one outside and on the inside of my doors. And there was an anti-Semitic act conducted where somebody had knocked off the mezuzah case and it, I found it on the floor with the scroll missing. And um, recently I was able to obtain a new scroll, but I have not yet found a new mezuzah cover. Um, so I'd love to speak to you more about your mezuzah covers and um, what your designs look like, <laughs> if you'd be willing. Well, I, I, mezuzah covers are one of the very, very easy gifts to newlyweds. Well, I don't give the cloth, that's their business. Mm -hmm. But the cover is available to them. So you come to my studio, I have a few uh, mezuzah covers that uh, are lying, but they're lying around, they in a box. And uh, if I see something that can form, can be the base of a mezuzah cover, or a mezuzah cover, I use it. And uh, it's a diversion, and yet a purposeful diversion. It's a practical thing. Absolutely. Well, I'd be honored, so we'll follow up with that after this. 
Um, great. So another question comes from Self Helps Natalia Montez in our finance department. Natalia asks, how did you feel after the piece Late Cloud was finished? I feel while I'm painting a painting or anything of that graphic until I it is something to work on. Once I sign a painting, I'm sort of saying goodbye to it. I say now go into the world, live your world. So I have paintings and that I made years and years ago. If I see them, I said how nice meeting an old friend, but I don't feel possessive about it. Mm. And uh, it becomes something that has to be or live on its own. Uh, it is, it sort of, it had fulfilled its function. It helped me, of course, or uh, over a specific time. Sometimes that time it was very easy. Sometimes it was disturbing, but it isn't mine anymore. Understood. And are you painting currently amidst the coronavirus situation? I'm not sure how to handle it. It sits sort of in the back of my mind. I really should write, paint it. And I have difficulty. I don't know how to do it. And uh, it may take a while. It may come tomorrow. I hope soon, sooner. But... Uh, how does one express such a situation? Obviously, I'm quite affected by this uh, current situation. And I've given it a lot of thought, feeling, and uh, I'm afraid I'd run into a political statement. <laughs> uh, what is it? that affects me mostly and it is the involvement and the non-involvement the distancing i feel that and again i'm trying to stay away from a political statement we all of us have to be involved all the way from the bottom to the top and that is where I feel my problem lies. That is, I have no connection to the kind of evasion. And it brings me back to a time during the war, which was at times rather difficult. And uh, there was a time, and I'm thinking now, of Auschwitz and other place, such place, Kaufering, a subcamp of Dachau, when I was not addressed as a person, but by a cuss word. And what, how did we, I, and the group around me react to it? And uh, I think that emotionally we survived by remaining what we were, a fair, good, well-ordered community. We said, please and thank you. We said, good morning. And how are you? Even in the worst of situations, in the middle of, you know, standing in a line, in striped uniforms, hungry, starving, pain in pain, we remained a civilized community. And I think it is that which kept us going emotionally. Physically, somebody shoots you, somebody beats life out of you physically, that can be helped. But emotionally, I and others remained who we were. So I th the, the kind of a moral stance helped us over that time. And such ideas remain within me, that stands. We are polite, we speak the truth. 
we do not prevent, prevent, present something that isn't. And uh, we have certain civilized and uh, civilized and civil behavior. And I think it is that community that is nice, the community that is caring, caring for each other, not being selfish and disrespectful of others. So though, yes, there were other ideas that came across. That is, then even, the notion of supranationalism, obviously at that time Nazi nationalism was, we saw its evil and I compared it to supranationalism in parts of Europe today. Hungary comes to mind. Uh, I'm not trying to put down Hungary or Hungarians, but it's kind of an illustration where the rulers of a country extol its national uh, qualities and feel it to be superior, to be the salt of the earth, where everybody else is not. The same goes for beliefs. That is, well, you can tell I'm a Jew, but uh, that's one of those 99 different flavors of Jews. But what comes to mind right now is the conflict in India between Muslims and Hindus. Now there is two groups, each of them claiming to have quote unquote the truth and whoever doesn't adhere must be evil by definition. So it is that item of my the mind of the human mind feeling national exceptionalism and religious exclusivity. And I feel that very, very strongly at work today. And obviously it impacts on me the fact that I'm talking about it. Tells me it's there. It was there 60 years or 75 years ago. It is there here today. And I see it's evil and I'm looking for a civilized community, a community that is fair, just and open and above all one where we are aware of the necessity of caring for each other. So beautifully said and words cannot express my gratitude to you for your words, your wisdom and sharing your self and your experience with us. And I hope that those who are viewing can continue to take your words and to move forward in gratitude, in care, in love and kindness for their fellow men and family members, loved ones, strangers that they don't even know, and just to humankind in general, because it starts with one and it starts with us. And Fred, it is an honor to have you here virtually to speak with us. Your words, your artwork, you just being you has touched my life and enhanced my life as well as the entire self-help community. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts and we will get through this together one day at a time. To wrap up, I want to thank everybody who is tuning in and thank you for helping us again, Fred, to bear witness and to become closer to the historical events of the Holocaust through your artwork. We have an obligation now and moving forward to share your story as well as other survivors' stories. And on behalf of Self Help Again, I'm wishing you and your entire family um, safety, wellness, and continued sanity amongst, amidst these times. If you watching have any questions about Hearts, the virtual gallery, 
or would like to ask questions about self-help community services, you can please feel free to reach out to me at 212-971-7792, or you can email me directly at dnazarian at selfhelp.net. Thank you again, Fred, for your words and for your presence. And I look forward to seeing you after all of this is over and a new chapter is turned. Thank you, Desi. And please, when, you, when we may again out, come out into the world, come here and get your business cover. Thank you, Fred. I'm sending you a virtual hug. Thank you, Dizzy. Bye. Bye.